Well, we've been blessed with some wonderful music this morning already. And if you made it out Tuesday or Thursday night to the school, CVCA, you were blessed with some beautiful music by our uh, first graders through 12th graders. Uh, just by a show of hands, who was performing? Who performed this last week at, at CVCA? Yeah, a number of you did. And I was able to make it for both of the concerts, and it was awesome. If you missed out, I'm sorry. Um, hopefully next year you can attend. How do you describe what happened there? I could say, well, there were a bunch of songs. Some of them were sung. Some were played on instruments. The band, others, handbells. And the kids did great. But if I said that, parents, would that be accurately describing the wonderful job that your kids did? That would fall far short, wouldn't it? Like, have you ever been to the symphony before? Who's ever been to the symphony before? Yeah, or a big time concert down at the Gallo or, or somewhere else. If you've been to the symphony and you've heard the wide array of, of instruments and music and just this wall of sound that hits you and envelops you and carries you along, it's hard to describe just how awesome that is to somebody who's never been before. I mean, you could, you could say, well, we went and, and we heard Beethoven's fifth, and it went something like, how's it go? Bum, 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 bum. No, I'm doing the wrong one. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. If I did that, would you instantly know just how wonderful it was? <laughs> Probably not, right? Definitely not. Because all I'm doing is I'm just... I'm making a poor attempt at the basic melody, but you're not hearing all the instruments and all the, the glory that is a full symphonic orchestra. And I think that that's sometimes how it is when we approach scripture. Pages are not sufficient to really tell the depth of the story, uh, let alone the experience that the people in the Bible went through. And so as we, as we turn to Acts chapter 2 this morning, I'm well aware that Luke didn't have the words to, to describe it all. And he certainly couldn't describe what it felt like when the Holy Spirit was poured out. It was just like someone saying, bum, 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 bum. That was the symphony. No, it was so much richer and fuller and, and broader than this. So as we read scripture, uh, we can use our sanctified imaginations. But even then, we realize they fall short. We, we look at the details that Scripture gives us, but even then we recognize we're missing out on the full experience. And I can't wait till heaven when we can get a better sense of what some of these events were like. But if, if my understanding of Scripture is correct, God not only wants to pour out His Spirit like He did back then, He wants to pour it out again in a powerful way. Something that all of us can experience if we are indeed willing. So we're in Acts chapter 2 today. Acts chapter 2, we left off um, halfway through Acts chapter 1. And in the end of Acts chapter 1, there is the choosing of a, of a 12th apostle. Um, Matthias is chosen. Peter stands up and he says, hey, I think it's good for us to replace Judas. Um, we're not aware that God told him to do this, but it seemed appropriate to the believers at this time. And so there were two candidates, people who'd been with them from the beginning, and they cast lots, they prayed about it, they cast lots, and the lot was chosen for Matthias. Now, casting lots was something that was common, or relatively speaking, in the Old Testament, but this is the only time in the New Testament that we read about this kind of thing. So it doesn't seem like that this is going to be something that, that God was telling us we should continue to do, because after this experience, then the Holy Spirit is poured out in a greater way. And we're given so many promises about how the Holy Spirit can guide us and lead us into all truth. So we don't have to cast lots. We simply can pray and ask for God's guidance. So Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of what? Pentecost. Uh, and this word itself contains the idea of 50. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Because the Pentecost 
was celebrated 50 days after Passover. Seven sevens and one day. This was exactly 50 days after Passover, 50 days after Jesus was crucified. This was one of of three great pilgrim feasts. There were three great feasts that people would come from all around to travel. It was like camp meeting, except they had three different camp meetings each year. And they were there. Um, The Jews were celebrating this Passover, and they regarded it, at least some did, as the same day in which the law was given from Mount Sinai. So interesting timing here. It seems like when Moses got the law from God, it was also 50 days after Passover. So Acts chapter 1, or chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now we talked last time about this group. It wasn't just the 12 that were gathered. How many people at least were gathered there in that place? 120. That's right, Frank. Uh, And this describes not only the 12, but there were women there. There was Mary, the mother of Jesus there. There was a large group gathered in one place. And this was probably the place, very possibly the place where they had celebrated the Lord's Supper. Perhaps the place, same place where they had gone to after the crucifixion and kind of retreated to and kind of stayed there in confusion and mourning and hiding and fear. And now they're gathered there because Jesus had told them, you're going to go, but before you go, you need to stay. Stay until the promise of the Holy Spirit. And they stayed there, as we saw last time, for 10 days. They're there in one place, in one accord. No longer are they fighting about who's the greatest. No longer are they getting jealous because they couldn't cast out a demon. No longer are they debating about these sorts of things. They had been there, and they had been praying. And they had been confessing their faults. And they had been asking for God to forgive themselves. And they'd been asking for others to forgive themselves. Uh, No longer were they refusing to wash each other's feet. A different spirit had come upon the believers because they were eagerly, actively seeking God in preparation for the Holy Spirit. They were there in that one place. And then the Bible says in verse 2, and suddenly there came what? There was a sound from heaven. They just heard this sound all of a sudden. And what did it sound like? Yeah, it sounded, my Bible says, like a rushing, mighty wind. Have you ever heard that before, where it's kind of relatively peaceful, and then all of a sudden a big wind hits the trees or hits your house and whoa what's that is that a storm coming i remember one time i was camping by myself in tennessee it was part of a spiritual retreat that i was on for a class i had to be by myself for 40 hours so i'm out by myself in tennessee camping i'm used to camping out in the pine forests of the west coast but this was a deciduous forest and it was a time when all the leaves had fallen off the trees And it had rained, and so trying to find dry firewood was more difficult. But I'm out there having a good time. It wasn't raining at the time. I'm sitting by the fire, playing my guitar, just enjoying worship experience uh, on a Sabbath evening. And then all of a sudden, I heard a wind hit the trees. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh, this is not a little breeze. This is a big one. Turns out later on, after I got home... (laughs) There had been tornado warnings, and I was just in my, in my tent. I had been memorizing, like, Psalm 46, which talks about God's protections, and how oh, the earth, you know, follow, or the mountains fall into the sea. I am in the midst, in, in God's protection, and so, so forth. And, but, but, but I know that sound when there's a sudden noise that's a wind, and it, I don't know what this sound was like, but that's what my mind goes back to. This sudden, loud noise that Luke can only describe as like a mighty rushing wind. And and then that sound, that wind, it says it filled the whole house where they were sitting. It comes into the room with them. It envelops the room. And they're just, this must be it. 
Jesus promised something was going to happen, and now it's happening. And then verse 3, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. It's not actual fire, but it's like fire. It appeared like fire. A ball of fire that came into the room. And then the Bible says it split into tongues. It split into individual bits of fire. Maybe they looked a lot like tongues. And it rested upon each of the believers. Uh, Not just the twelve. This was all of them. Men, women, older, younger, apostles, not apostles. But they were all followers of Jesus. And it sat upon them. It rested upon them. And verse 4 says, and they were all filled. All of them. Can you picture this in your mind? And again, I'm describing it, but I'm just doing like bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. But you got to picture it in your mind. Imagine what that must have been like. How exciting this must have been. And, and, And just an awesome experience. Now, it's interesting. The Holy Spirit, the word for spirit is the Greek word pneuma. Uh, which is spirit, breath, or wind. Uh, And so it's very fitting that accompanying the onset of the Holy Spirit was wind or something like wind. Remember in John chapter 3, Jesus said, the wind blows where it wishes, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So is the Holy Spirit. And so this wind accompanies this experience, and then all of them were filled with, with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? It says, they began to speak with what? Other tongues. This is not saying that uh, like a literal tongue came into their mouth and they started speaking with a different tongue other than their own. This is the word for tongue, which is often used in the context of language. They're speaking in other languages. All of a sudden, These people, many of them largely uneducated, and now they know other languages. Pretty awesome when you think about it. And they spoke, verse 4 says, as the Spirit gave them utterance. They weren't just speaking their own words. They were speaking inspired by the Holy Spirit. And then a crowd starts to form. Look at verse 5. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem... Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when, they, when the sound occurred, the multitude came together. So the people in the neighborhood, they heard a sound, and they're like, what's going on? The people in the city, they heard this sound. And you know how it is if, if a big sound happens in your neighborhood, the neighbors, they come out of their house to see what happens, like someone hit a telephone pole and it's falling down, or the ambulance comes, or, or there's a fire People want to know, what's going on? And so people from from all over start pouring out into the streets. And the disciples apparently are are pouring out into the streets as well. And and the people are from everywhere. They're from all over the place. Remember, this was a pilgrim time when they were coming from all over. And the Jews had been dispersed all around the, the, uh, the Mediterranean all over the place. We call it the the then-known world, although there were other parts of the world that were were known. But they were coming from all over the place. The the ten tribes, they were carried away in like 702 BC or 722 by the Assyrians. Uh, They were carried away all over the place. Judah was transported to Babylon three different times. Daniel was included in that group starting in 605 BC. And then between the Old and the New Testament, there were people that were taken to Egypt as well. And so there were Jewish people that were there for the the festival from all over. And by now, they had learned other languages. And there was great confusion because they're hearing now the believers speaking with different languages. Notice what it says there. Verse 6, and when the the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So this wasn't a manifestation of the gift of tongues where people were speaking and nobody understood and it was just this unintelligible experience. We call that glossolalia. Uh, By the way, the Greek word for tongue is is glossa. Uh, And you've probably heard the word glossary. Um, These words 
go together from their Greek origin. But they're speaking in known languages. This wasn't some mystical experience where only the believer, well, not even the believer understood. The believer knew what they were saying, and other people understood in languages that were known. Does that make sense? And think about, why was the gift of tongues given? What had Jesus told the disciples that they were going to be doing in Matthew 28? Go and preach to who? Everybody. Starting in, in the places closest and extending to the whole world. Well, if you're just a simple Galilean, if you're a fisherman, and you only know Aramaic, maybe you know some words in Greek, you know, uh, how are, how's the gospel going to go to everybody if you don't speak every language? And so the gift of tongues was given so that the gospel could be spread and so that it could, could go rapidly. And that's exactly what we see happening here. People from other backgrounds hearing and marveling. Verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled and said to one another, Look, are not all those who speak Galileans? Now this is actually kind of a put down. The, the Galileans were kind of regarded as people we might call like hillbillies. Now, no offense if you're a hillbilly. I have a little hillbilly. I think, I think a lot of us have a little hillbilly in us. Uh, my dad knew some people who might be classified as hillbillies. He said, we prefer the term mountaineers. Mountaineers. Um, so there were these folks from Galilee that they talked a little bit different and they maybe weren't viewed as refined as the other parts. And that was largely the people Jesus called to follow him. And now, these folks from around Galilee, they're talking languages that they shouldn't know. It's impossible for them to know all these languages. And the multitude is confused. What's going on? Verse 8, And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? There were the Parthians, and they spoke a, a, a version, they spoke Persian, and the Medes perhaps spoke Persian as well. And the Elamites, and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, those in Mesopotamia probably had a variant of Aramaic. So there's different dialects that are being spoken. Um, the Bible continues, those in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, uh, this is not like China as we think about this. This is more like the area of Turkey. Uh, but these people are coming from all over the place. And they're each hearing it in their own unique language or dialect. There, verse 10, there were people from Phrygia and Pamphylia. These were provinces that were there. Uh, small districts in Roman Asia. Those dwelling in Mesopotamia. Or excuse me, that's skipped back a verse. Egypt. They spoke Coptic in Egypt. And there were parts of Libya joining Cyrene, adjoining Cyrene. This is people from Africa, the continent of Africa that are there. They're hearing in their own language. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Now probably what's happening here is the disciples are speaking and they're speaking one language. Um, not all of them. It wasn't called the gift of hearing. It was called the gift of tongues, the gift of speaking. So there's one disciple, and he's speaking in Coptic. And those from Egypt gather around because they're hearing their native tongue. And those um, Parthians that are hearing their native language from Persia, the Persian language, they gather around another disciple who's speaking and praising God. And so there's all these different groups, and they're all together praising God and so excited about what God has done. And, and everyone is just amazed by this experience. And notice, there are two responses to this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Verse 12 gives us the first response. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? They recognized, well, this, God's doing something special here. What's going on? We don't know what God is doing, but this is amazing, and this is awesome. There was that response, and then notice the other response, verse 13. Others 
mocking said, they're full of new wine. There were one group of people who said, this is awesome, God's doing something special. And there were other people who said, these guys are just drunk. Uh, and probably a better translation for new wine, which the New King James happened, has, is sweet wine. This happened not at the time of the grape harvest. That was later on. Uh, so this, they're referring to alcoholic wine. In the Bible, there's the word wine, which sometimes just means grape juice. That's what we use when we celebrate communion. And other times it means alcoholic beverages. So you have to look at the context. So they're saying, these guys are just drunk. But that doesn't make a lot of sense because usually when people get drunk, they make less sense, not more sense. But here are these people from Galilee who shouldn't know these other languages, and they are speaking articulately in another language that they never knew before. There will always be people who mock, who reject the genuine working of the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus had this experience. Remember, there was a girl who, who had died, and he goes into the house, but he says, she's just sleeping, and I'm going to go wake her up. And the Bible says there were people that mocked him to scorn. Well, he went in that house, and he raised her from the dead. Noah, building that ark. God's given him a message. He's preaching for 120 years. He's building that ark, and there were people who were mocking him Day after day, even when they got on the ark, seven days, no rain, mocking outside. They had an opportunity, but instead their hearts were hardened and they laughed at the work of God. There are a lot of examples in the Bible, sufficient examples for us to see these two kinds of responses. One that is open to what God is doing and another where people are closed hearted. And they even go so far as to laugh and make fun of and to mock. And Jesus said, we can expect it in the last days. We can expect that there will be people who turn on you because of your stance. Now, just because someone's turning on you, that doesn't mean that you're in the right path. Right? They might be turning away from you because you're a person that needs to repent. So we don't just look at that. But Jesus did say, these things will happen, and we can expect it to happen. But how sad. The, the, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, were legitimately filled with the Holy Spirit, and there were people who were saying, no, they're filled with alcoholic spirits. And this is very similar to what Jesus said about, there's a lot of sins in this world, but the sin against the Holy Spirit, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, is something that can't be forgiven. And it wasn't because... God can't forgive. It's because when you look at the work of the Holy Spirit and you say that is the work of Satan and not of God, if that's your spirit and continues to be your spirit, you close yourself off to the work of the Holy Spirit in your own life. And so the Holy Spirit, the one that leads us to repentance, is unable to do so because we're rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit. But you know, the work of receiving the Spirit or rejecting the Spirit, it doesn't happen in one moment. It doesn't happen in a single day. Next month, I have some pastors' meetings in Lexington, Kentucky. And I'm excited to go see pastoral colleagues from all across North America. But I'm also excited because after it's done, I'm going to stick around for an extra day and a half because Lexington is an hour from some of the best climbing in America of a certain type. And I'm going to go climbing with my buddy Nathan, who, who moved to Tennessee. But you know, if I'm not training and preparing for the Red River Gorge climbing experience, I'm not going to have nearly as much fun. And so what I'm doing now is I am, when I go to the gym here, I am climbing on holds and types of climbs that are more similar to the type of climbing I'll meet when I get there. Being ready for something doesn't happen in just a moment. It takes a process. We as Adventists believe that God who poured out the early rain, the former rain, also wants to pour out the latter rain. But we're fooling ourselves if we just think, one day, I'll just be filled with the Spirit. One day, I'll just stop being a nasty person. 
and I'll be filled with the Spirit, and then I'll be a nice person. That's not how it works. In the same way that the disciples spent those 10 days in the upper room, earnest days, seeking, repenting, confessing, asking for God to fill them, the same way God wants us daily to be seeking His Spirit now. I'm reminded of a, a powerful statement uh, from a book called Testimonies to Ministers. So I'm going to read this for myself, but you can listen in on my conversation I'm going to have with myself here. Many have in great measure failed to receive the former reign, the Holy Spirit that's available to us now. They have not obtained all the benefits that God has thus provided for them, they expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. Oh, one of these days, when the richest abundance of grace shall be, shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. They are making a terrible mistake. Procrastinating with their spiritual life until some future day, and then I'll witness for you, then I'll be spiritual for you on that day. And I think if we're honest, most of us have, have kind of thought about those things. I'll get serious about God when things start to get serious. They're already serious. But it says this, Only those who are living up to the light that they have received will receive greater light. Are you following what the Holy Spirit's saying to you today? How will we receive future blessings from the Spirit if we're not willing to do the Spirit's will today. Continuing, unless they are daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Friends, I want to take a lesson from Acts chapter 2. I want to learn from the example of the disciples who received the Spirit. And I don't want to be like those who are mocking, who are trying to discredit the work of God. How about you? I don't know what God is saying to you right now. It may be something different to each one of us. But my invitation to you this morning as we close and, and wrap up with a word of prayer is to just open your heart to what God wants to do in your life today. The things that he's kind of been pricking your conscience about, do something about it today. The, the areas of your life where you know, you know, I'm kind of quenching the Holy Spirit. I'm kind of tamping down what God's wanting to do in my heart. Stop doing that. Receive power from the Holy Spirit to receive more of the Holy Spirit. We won't regret it. We won't regret it. And someday, um, as we are continuing to work in the power of the Spirit now, I believe we're going to get an extra special boost. An extra special wave of God's grace and Holy Spirit will give us the, the final power that we need to finish the work that's impossible for us in our own strength. And I want to be a part of that. How about you? Let's pray. Dear God, we don't deserve to receive more of you. But Jesus, we are so thankful that because of your blood and your perfect life, um, you've given us all things, here, now, and forever. And so we are worthy in your sight. Show us in practical steps how we can better serve you, better follow you, better open our hearts to you, and give us joy as we do for you, work for you, work with you, and await the even greater blessings in the future. This is our prayer. Let all God's disciples say, Amen and Amen.